Testament teaches that love bears or forbears with other people. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4 and in verse 2 that we should be with all lowliness and gentleness with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love. As I thought about this question, I also thought about the fact that in the Old Testament, lepers were quarantined. They had to dwell outside the camp, and while that is certainly an Old Testament passage, and we're not living under that Old Covenant today, I think it's worthy of our consideration to note this very fact. Love wants to help people. Love doesn't want to hurt anyone. And so this is uh, the way I would respond to this particular question. And if, you, if, the, if the questioner has further questions, I'll be happy to talk with you further about that. Well, the second question that we want to address is this one. What significance for believers, if any, might there be in the following order of events? Jesus, baptism, temptation in the wilderness, beginning to preach. And the querist gave me some additional information to help me maybe better understand what was behind this particular question. And so the questioner said, for further detail, for clarification, I know Paul also delayed preaching after his conversion for a time, but Andrew seems to have brought his brother right away to meet Jesus. I'm sure there is wisdom in time to learn and grow before trying to teach and instruct others, especially knowing that teachers will be more harshly judged. But do you think that some period of growth following baptism is scripturally demanded before one should try to reach others? What I think I'm going to do is talk with you about the temptation of Jesus in a sermon, perhaps next Lord's Day. But in this period, I want to kind of address what the questioner uh, had to say in this background material. So basically, the question is this. Should some time elapse before a new Christian tries to teach others? Well, the questioner allu alluded to something that James tells us in James chapter 3, and in verse 1, when he says, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. James is telling us that teachers will be held to a higher standard by the Lord. But the Hebrew writer indicates that in time, Students of God's Word should become teachers of God's Word. In Ephesians chapter, Ephesians, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12, the writer says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid Food. Who did the writer make that statement to? Well, obviously, to those who would be reading this letter. Christians. He didn't address this statement merely to preachers or elders or Bible class teachers. He addressed this statement, it seems to me, to the average Christian. And there's a bit of a rebuke here. He says, by the time you ought to be teachers, you need to be taught the very basics all over again. So I think that statement tells us that in time, students of the Bible should become teachers of 
the Bible depending upon their ability and their opportunity. Those are two factors that we would need to think about as well. Now let me say the obvious. You can't teach what you don't know. And you can't know what you don't study. Maybe I, I ought to re rephrase that. You shouldn't. <laughs> you shouldn't try to teach what you don't know. I guess we can try to teach something we don't know, but it doesn't work out very well, does it? If we're going to teach somebody, we need to be equipped and prepared to do that. Common sense would tell us that. But we need to realize that if we wait till we know it all, we'll never get started. Common sense tells us that as well. And so teachers of the Word of God need to be students of the Word of God. And if we wait till we know it all, first of all, we'll never get there. We're not going to know it all. And if we wait till we know it all, we'll never get started. So that's something that we need to keep in mind as well. Let me remind you, and you're very familiar with this passage, that when Saul of Tarsus spearheaded a massive persecution against the church in Jerusalem, Luke tells us that the saints in Jerusalem were scattered abroad and they went everywhere preaching the word. Why did they preach the word when they scattered? Well, I would suggest to you they did that because that's what they had been doing at home. And I would conclude from that that they had been taught and trained by the apostles to share the gospel with others. I, I very quickly looked into the chronology. How, how long after Pentecost was the church in Jerusalem scattered? I looked into that quickly. I didn't do an exhaustive study, but it seems to me that this occurred somewhere between three and five years after Pentecost, and I suspect it was closer to three than to five. And so, in a relatively short period of time, those who were converted to Christ on Pentecost, when they were scattered, they were teaching others the gospel. Now, in the follow-up information that the questioner provided, it was said that Paul waited for a time before he began to teach others but I think the questioner has overlooked something. Because in Acts chapter 9, in verse 19 and 20, Luke tells us that Paul began immediately to preach and teach in Damascus. Notice he says, So when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Now my guess is that the one who asked this question was thinking about something that Paul says in Galatians chapter 1, that he went off into Arabia for a time, and then he comes back to Damascus, and then he goes down to Jerusalem, and he, when he made his first visit to Jerusalem after his conversion, that was three years later. But Luke tells us that Paul immediately began to preach in the synagogues of Damascus. But I hasten to point out that Paul would not have been starting from scratch. Because remember, he had been taught and trained 
at the feet of Gamaliel, one of the famous Jewish rabbis in the first century. So it's not like Paul was a complete babe in Christ knowing virtually nothing when he became a Christian. <clears throat> he would have been prepared to a great extent by his Jewish background, by the training that he had received from Gamaliel. <clears throat> I want you to notice something that Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 8. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 8. He says, For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place... Your faith toward God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. Paul indicates in that statement that the gospel was sounded forth from Thessalonica not long after they were converted to Christ. I say that because in the second chapter of 1 Thessalonians, Paul says in verse 17 and 18, But we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored more eagerly to see your face with great desire. Therefore we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan hindered us. Notice he says, But we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short time, it was just a short time earlier that Paul and his companions had to leave Thessalonica. And now he's writing to them. We don't know for sure how much time elapsed, but it may have been somewhere in the neighborhood of six months or so. And yet already the gospel was being sounded forth from Thessalonica. <clears throat> It seems to me that new converts should be able to explain, at least to some extent, what they did to become a Christian. Don't you think someone who becomes a Christian ought to know what they're doing when they do that? Nod your heads this way. Yeah, you ought to understand what you're doing. Well, then it seems to me that you ought to be able to tell somebody else <laughs> what you did and why you did that. Now, there's going to be a lot that you don't know, but there's going to be some things that new Christians can know and can share with others. <clears throat> I think one of the reasons that we're timid or afraid to try to share the gospel with other people is we worry about them asking us a question that we don't know how to answer. Right? We're worried about that, aren't we? Can I tell you how to deal with that? If somebody asks you a question and you don't know the answer, what you need to tell them is, I don't know. Those three little words will go a long way in helping you when you're stumped by a question that somebody asks you. You might also say, well, I've, I've never thought about that before. I've not considered what you're saying before can I look into that and get back with you? Now what do you think they're going to say if you tell them that? Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. I don't have a problem with that. I think those three statements are really good ways to handle a question 
that you don't know how to answer. Above everything, don't get angry. Don't get angry. Whatever you do, don't get angry. Now, I've made that mistake. I had a home Bible study with a fellow when I was preaching in Bowling Green, Kentucky, and before it was over, we were yelling at one another. And I am ashamed of that. I am embarrassed by that. So I've made that mistake. Don't allow yourself to get angry. So there are things that a new convert can share with others. And you learn as you go. I hope I'm a better teacher now than I was in 1980 when I started preaching full-time. It's a process. You're going to learn as you go. You're going to make some mistakes. You ask the Lord to help you not to make mistakes and to forgive you when you make mistakes and you go on. I don't know of any other way to do it. Well, I'm going to have to hurry. What guidance would you give someone who wants to dig deeper into a text without learning to read Greek, without learning the original languages? Well, there are several things that I want to say in response, but the first thing that I want to say is you've got to spend time digging. You cannot dig deeper if you're not willing to invest the time in digging. It just can't be done. The wise man says in Proverbs chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. Yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, if you search, if you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. To find the knowledge of God, we've got to seek for that knowledge as we would seek silver and gold. And so, folks, we just can't dig deeper if we're not willing to invest time in that process. Now, having said that, how do we dig deeper? Well, let me suggest several things. If you're studying a passage, it's good to read that passage multiple times. And I like to underline statements that I think are important in my Bible. And I like to highlight key words. Now, if, you're, if you don't want to underline and mark up your Bible... You can still do that by printing out the passage you're studying. And then you can mark it up and you can leave your Bible clean and pristine and all of that. But I tell you what, it helps me to mark up my Bible. I would suggest that it's good to read the passage in different translations. You need to have one Bible translation that you use most of the time that you study from, but it is also good to read other Bible translations as you're studying that passage. How do you get these other translations? Well, there are parallel Bibles that are published that you can buy from a religious bookstore that will have maybe three or four different translations in parallel columns. That's one way to do it. 
And certainly you can do that with Bible computer software. I'll have more to say about that in a little bit. It's good to use versions with different translation philosophies. Not every English translation uh, follows the same philosophy as far as that translation work is concerned. English translations fall on a continuum or a spectrum. Some are what they call formal equivalent translations or literal, notice that word's in quotation marks. In other words, they strive to be as much as possible word-for-word -word translations. On th at the other end of the spectrum, there are functional or dynamic equivalent translations, and they are more thought-for-thought -thought translations. Here's another chart basically saying the same kind of thing, and you can see where some of these English translations fall on that spectrum. Well, it's good to read passages from translations that fall at various places in the spectrum. When you're studying a passage, you need to note the genre of the passage. The Bible is a library of books. And there's different kinds of literature in the, in the Bible. There's narrative, there's law, poetry, proverbs, prophecy, parables, letters, apocalyptic language like in the book of Revelation. You don't interpret a proverb the same way you interpret law. Proverbs, by their very nature, are general statements of truth, but they often have exceptions. And so we may very well make a mistake in interpreting a proverb if we don't recognize that they are rules of thumb. They are maxims, not axioms. When we're reading a passage, we need to pay attention to the people and the supernatural beings that may be discussed in that passage. We need to focus on biblical events if we find that in our passage. We need to explore the larger context. Meaning is derived from context. Let me say that a different way. Context determines meaning, always. So we've got to pay attention to the context. And we can think of context as a set of concentric circles. We'll start with a verse of Scripture. But that verse is going to be found in a paragraph. And that paragraph will be found in a chapter. And the chapter may be found in a section. Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is Matthew's account of the Sermon on the Mount. That's a section of Scripture that goes beyond chapter divisions. Paul's discussion of spiritual gifts is found in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. So we need to think about the sections where we find our information. And then, of course, there's the book. Well, I couldn't get everything on one chart, and so now I'm going to pick up where I left off. But there's a context beyond the book. There is the corpus context. By that I mean the writings of Paul, the writings of John, the writings of Peter. Sometimes we need to think about that. And then, of course, there is the New Testament context. And then the Old Testament context. And the context of the Bible as a whole. So as we're studying, we need to be thinking about context. 
certainly we need to focus on the immediate context of a verse, but then we've got to remember that there are broader contexts beyond that. As we're studying, we need to ask the same questions that every good newspaper reporter has to ask to get the story and to get it right. I'm sure you've heard preachers tell you this on other occasions. Well, it's still true. We've got to think about who's talking and to whom is he addressing his remark. What does he say? Sometimes when something is said is important. Sometimes where a statement is made is important. We've got to ask the why question, but we've got to remember that the Bible doesn't always answer the why question. It's good to ask the question. It's good to think about that. But sometimes God doesn't answer that question. We need to ask the how question. And one of the most important questions that we have to ask is the so what question. What does this mean to me? How does this apply to my life? How can I use this information from the Bible? Are you beginning to appreciate a bit more why I said you got to spend time digging? You need to look for and define key words if you don't already know what those words mean. Words like justification, redemption, propitiation. How do we do that? Well, we can start with English dictionaries, but they are, they are of limited value because the Old Testament was written in Hebrew and Aramaic and the New Testament was written in Greek. What we're really concerned about is not so much the meaning of the English words in our English Bibles, but the meaning of the original words. It is helpful to identify important cross-references. How do we do that? Well, a very helpful tool is the center column reference in your Bible. How many of you have a Bible with a center column reference or some other kind of reference, maybe at the bottom of the page, something like that? Well, those can be very helpful tools. There is a book called The Treasury of Scripture Knowledge. That's what that represents. And what it is, is the center column reference in your Bible on steroids. And then there's another book called The New Treasury of Scripture Knowledge, and it is the Treasury of Scripture Knowledge on steroids. Books like that can be helpful. You need to summarize what you've learned. Summarize the passage, perhaps putting it in your own words. It can be helpful to outline the passage that you're studying. And then good study Bibles can help you in your study, like the Faith Life Study Bible, the ESV Study Bible, MacArthur Study Bible. You can consult good, concise commentaries like the Bible Knowledge Commentary, the Wycliffe Bible Commentary, the New International Bible Commentary, the New Living Bible Commentary, the New Bible Commentary Revised. Those are brief commentaries that I use in my study. And then there are more exhaustive commentaries. The New International Commentary on the Old Testament and on the New Testament the Tyndale set on the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Truth Commentaries published by Brethren, Truth for Today Commentaries published by Brethren as well. You've got to think about how the passage applies to you and then share your insights with others. Well, let me quickly mention some reasons to use commentaries. 
They can help you learn about textual difficulties. And there's all kinds of textual difficulties that you're not going to know anything about if you just read your English translation unless it contains some notes that point these things out. Commentaries can identify nuances in the original text. Sometimes the tense of a verb can be very important. Sometimes the original text will have things like word plays and alliteration and other literary things going on that are not obvious in English translations. Now, you may or may not need to know that as far as understanding the basic meaning of the text, but sometimes those things can be helpful. You can learn about structure from commentaries and cultural background. You can learn how to interpret difficult passages. What's the sin unto death? What's blasphemy against the Holy Spirit all about? Well, commentaries will tell you, good ones at least, will tell you how those passages have been understood and interpreted by others. And so commentaries can help you identify themes, help you learn how to explain alleged discrepancies and contradictions, help you see principles and lessons help you see biblical connections. You can learn about the history of interpretation. If you were to read commentaries on the Song of Solomon, you would find out that years ago it was commonly interpreted as an allegory to teach us about Christ and the church. More recent commentaries have moved away from that type of interpretation at least to some extent. They can help you evaluate different interpretations. They can help you answer erroneous arguments. And then you can just profit from other people's study. The men who write commentaries maybe study a book for years. Well, you can profit from their study. How do we find good commentaries? Well, there's a website called bestcommentaries.com that you can find on the internet and it evaluates commentaries. Now it's denominational people doing the evaluation but it's still helpful. My preaching uh, friend Mark Roberts out in Texas has put together what he calls the commended commentary list and it's a list of recommendations from brethren um, and I have a copy of that, and I can get that to you if you'd like. You can ask bookstore workers, the CI Bookstore in Athens, Bookstore at Florida College, the One Stone Bookstore in, in, uh, in Bowling Green, Kentucky. If everything else fails, you might ask your preacher. Maybe he could help you a little bit. Um, I use commentaries all the time in my study. All kinds of Bible helps. Uh, are available to assist you. And I'll not read those off. Um, I, I've been using Bible computer software for probably 25 to 30 years, somewhere in there. And I am a big fan. It has made my work much easier and much faster. And um, I would encourage you, if you have a computer, to use Bible computer programs. Here's a list. Uh, and that website there uh, evaluates some of these programs. Uh, Bible computer programs make it so much easier and so much faster to do in depth Bible study. Obviously, you've got to have a computer. <laughs> But if you have a computer, um, I, I really think you're cheating yourself if you're not using these tools. eSword you can download for free. Diana DeGro uses that program a lot. She can tell you more about that. Uh, I use the Logos program. Uh, it, it is excellent. I love it. But it's expensive but you get what you pay for. Well, I'm out of time. Thank you.